Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. Today I'm going to show you how to install an operating system on a micro SD card. You're going to be able to boot it from a Pinebook Pro. Beyond that, I'm going to show you how to use GitHub in order to manage your repositories, how to pull down the data, how to make changes locally and then push them back to the server. Stick around. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Nimble Streamer and Telestream Wirecast. Tune in through Roku, Kodi, Plex, or other HLS video players. For local show times, visit our website, category5.tv. Now, this broadcast is brought to you by BP9, Scott Barkley, Ron Morissette, Jerry Kowalski, Jonathan Garby, Jens Nissen, Bo Lechnowski, and Bill Marshall, plus all of you who decided to support our recent Kickstarter campaign, uh, or those of you who have donated to ensure Category 5 made it into this new studio space, um, or our patrons at patreon.com slash category5. I mean, I couldn't do this show without your support. I couldn't have survived this move without your support, especially during a pandemic. And uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has supported Category 5 Technology TV. Before we jump into the show this week, I want to remind you, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Click that bell to receive notifications whenever we are live or when we post exciting new content. I mentioned a few weeks back that we want to hit 25,000 subscribers, and so far this month, Another 350 of you have subscribed. That brings our total to 24,756 subscribers. We can do it. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, head on over to linuxtechshow.com and do so. And once we hit that 25,000 mark, I am honor bound to do a fancy dance number for you. Sorry about that. Several weeks back, Rocco from Linux Spotlight interviewed me, and that interview was released this morning. It's been really neat for me to see the number of viewers who, well, I guess viewers of Rocco's show, Linux Spotlight, who have expressed that, uh, that they've been watching Category 5 Technology TV since the very early days. Kevin Y. Currents, for example, says that he's been watching the show since then. Uh, Peter 14, uh, even predates the show having uh, watched some of my very early YouTube videos. He said on Twitter, I got into Linux thanks to Robbie back in 2004 with Lindos when his show was live from his living room. A great person at heart who has helped so many around the world. Thank you so much. Jill Bryant Rineker says, uh, and I should mention, she's actually one of the co-hosts on Linux Gamecast uh, LWDW. She says, uh, I have been watching Robbie's great Linux content for years, and I'm so looking forward to watching the Linux Spotlight. Tony Hughes says on Twitter, really pleased about this. Robbie was an inspiration and fantastic help to me as a noob. Cheers. As Nick says, uh, as Nix says, great interview. I have followed Robbie's Cat5 TV for several years, and it's always good. Thank you so much. And Joe Panico says, I really like what Robbie has done with his tech platforms. Because of these fabulous interviews, we get a glimpse into the lives of the people we have come to know at some level. The full interview is about an hour and a half long. Uh, don't watch it now. You can watch this show first and then we'll tune into the interview. But I'll show you a clip in just a moment. So. Um, in the course of the hour and a half interview, we get into a ton of topics, both personal and behind the scenes here at Category 5 TV. Uh, everything from open source, uh, my early days in Linux, my very first computer, and uh, the value of buying no-name margarine. It'll all make sense a little later. <laughs> Here's that short sample from the interview for you.
Welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. I'm your host, Rocco, and with me today, our special guest is Robbie Ferguson. Hey, Robbie, Rocco. how are you? Hey, doing great. You? I am doing excellent, dude. These days when I say I'm doing great, you got to give the air quotes. Yeah. Doing well, great. Hanging in. You're doing, doing the, the best, best that can. you can. That's it. Yep. Well, I think that's what we're all doing right now. So, Yes, sir. Yep. Um, you have shows like Technology TV and Newsroom. They cover all of technology, not just Linux. Uh, people will know you from that. But if you were to meet somebody that didn't know you, what would you say to them if they said, who's Robbie Ferguson personally? Who am I? I, I guess, um, you know, I'm a family guy. I'm a, uh, I, I have a, a wife and three kids at home. And uh, we have a great time together. And, and I love spending time with them. We love, like we do our nature hikes as often as we can. And we're just finally getting to that point now where we can do that. The weather is nice enough here in Ontario, Canada, um, that uh, we've been doing that every weekend. So I, I like family time. I like doing things with, with my kids and, and helping, well, having them involved in my hobbies. So that could be like having my son do maker tech with me. Um, connecting right. GPIO on a Raspberry Pi to some circuit that I'm about to blow up, you know, that kind of stuff. So we try to do things together. Teaching them right. Learning, learning and bringing them along for the ride. So, you know, cause I'm always on a quest to learn. I'm, I'm never, I'm never happy with like, I'm never at that point where I'm done. I, yeah. I know all there is to know. I, I don't need to learn more. I'm if I get to the point where, okay, I know enough about one topic, I'm moving on to something else. So I, I like to bring them with me. Right. Well, let's go down his, uh, history lane and go back to the beginning of your computers. What was the first computer that you used? The, the, what I would attribute, what I would say is the first computer that I ever sat down and, and coded on would have been the VIC-20. Uh, and I used that thing like crazy. Like I, I got to the point where I was writing code at, you know, five, six years old, um, which incidentally, you know, I always thought, oh, that's crazy. Like coding at six years old. And, and my sons have done the same. Um, and you know, my nine-year-old now, our youngest is, uh, is coding in Roblox and it's, and it's, so that throws me back to those days. And, and, uh, I, I really like that time where computers, we understood how they worked. We understood the in, inner workings of them. So taking apart the Commodore VIC-20 was something that I, I was familiar with. But but the first real computer, like PC, would have been an XT, which, as funny as it is, this big old IBM system that like is a boat anchor, as we say, um, I wasn't allowed to have a computer. So it was under blankets hidden in my closet. Like that's, that's the kind of nerd I am that as a child, I hid an XT computer in my closet so that my dad wouldn't find it and get me in trouble. I don't, I, I can't even imagine what I did with the monitor. I, I don't know how I figured out how to hide a did CRT he ever, monitor. Did he ever find it? <laughs> I, I can't imagine he didn't, but he never mentioned it. So <laughs> I think he probably, he must have known, but my naive, stupid kid mind <laughs> thinks right. that, oh, the, dad doesn't know. And it's like this massive computer. <laughs> now, how long is it before you make the switch to Linux? Um, well, Lindos, Lindos was a complete switch. Yeah. Complete switch right from there. Yeah. Um. I used uh, an early version of Adobe Photoshop in Wine because the old version ran fine under under Wine. So, and then as soon as like CS2 came out, it was no longer 
it wasn't working quite what quite right so because back then gimp was really bad um but they've since fixed that with 2.10 so um like scaling is is a lot better now but um yeah lindos was about the time when i switched i mean i i'm na- i'm not name dropping it was it was a classic distro they got sued by microsoft for for the name <laughs> they had to change it to linspire which made no <laughs> sense and then they and in typical Michael Robertson style, he just fired everybody and sold the company and all the creative rights and everything. And now it's owned by somebody else. But so. yeah, but that got me to love Debian. Debian got me to love Ubuntu. Ubuntu got me to love Mark Shuttleworth and yep. <laughs> the whole the whole ecosystem of uh, realizing that you can run a business based on support rather than product. Um, I think that that was kind of a, a revelation for me too. So, so it's, it's it, like everybody, you know, like you kind of move along with the waves and find where you're at right now. I run Linux mint 19, like it's, that's, I'm old school. So I like the Mate interface. And, well, I was going to ask you, so why do you, you've tried all of them. So why did you stick with Linux mint? Uh, been with it since 19 was released and that's, Mainly because it was, it just is a brilliant out of the box experience. I didn't, I, I kind of, I fell out of love with Ubuntu for a little while because of uh, Unity. Unity made me fall out of love with Ubuntu. You weren't a fan? Definitely not. No. Um, and I very much am a little old school in my desktop paradigm. So I say I, I, prefer Mate. I really do. Um, I really do like that interface. Like that's where I'm comfortable. So um, Linux Mint with Mate is a fantastic distro out of the box. Everything works. Um, And uh, they still support Compass, (laughs) which brings me all kinds of nerd joy. (laughs) Well, um, you know, not to sway you or anything, not to tempt you to (laughs) distro hop, but have you tried Ubuntu Mate? And compared yeah. it to Linux oh, Mint yeah. Mate? Yeah, uh, what Martin and, and Popey are doing are, is fantastic work. Um, and, and I have run that on some of my lower-end systems, and I love it. I've had it on laptops and stuff. Nothing, my choice to use Linux Mint right now is not to say that Ubuntu Mate is not brilliant. It really is. Um, but this is just where I've landed. <laughs> there you go. When, when you know how things work under the hood, a lot of stuff is very similar. So it's really just finding a stable distro that works out of the box. that doesn't waste a lot of your time setting it up. Um, because I use uh, um, Linux Mint at, uh, at work. I, I need something that I can like reinstall in, and be up and running in an hour and you know, back in business kind of thing. So it's worked. Not that I couldn't do that with Ubuntu Mate. It's just where you are. It's just where I'm at. Yeah. And I think that makes it really confusing too for, for new Linux users because, well, which, which flavor should I go with? Which distro? Why Ubuntu Mate versus Linux Mint with Mate? It's really, they're all very, very similar. So it's community. It's the ecosystem of the distro itself. It's, you know, where, where's the support that you know, I don't need support, so I'm not really caring about that so much, but a novice user would. So, yep. You can watch the full interview on Linux Spotlight at cat5.tv slash spotlight. We've got to take a quick break. When we return, I'm going to tackle some of your viewer questions and the comments that have arrived this week about the Pinebook Pro. Stick around. Welcome back. Looking at the Pinebook Pro feature from last week, a lot of you have started receiving your Pinebook Pro shipments. And so these little quirks are coming up and we're starting to see some comments coming in. BP9 was posting in our Discord server today, which is why I have my phone with me. I'm not being antisocial, I'm being social. See how I did that? 
Uh, BP9 was having trouble with the keyboard. The D key was kind of sticky and not quite working and found that he was able to very carefully pry up that key and get some compressed air underneath and blow out underneath of the, uh, the contact. And for some reason, that fixed it for him. So I'm glad to hear that the D key is now working. BP9 also mentioning that while I showed on my Pinebook Pro that a quick tap on the uh, Pine logo and F11 would enable and disable Wi-Fi, and that seemed to work fine for, for our demonstration last week. Um, he's mentioning that on his notebook, on his Pinebook Pro, he had to actually hold in that key sequence for three seconds. So if you're finding that it's not having an impact, perhaps that's the difference. Follow the same tutorial from last week on how to get the Wi-Fi working on your new Pinebook Pro, but try holding it in for three seconds if my demonstration of really quickly tapping didn't do it for you. So that's good to know as well. Um, the final thing that BP9 mentions is that um, his keyboard came preset up with the UK keyboard layout. Well, that could be frustrating because your keys are not going to be in the right spot. So basically ISO layout versus ANSI. And so you'd have trouble entering your password and things like that. Interestingly enough, when I booted up and fired up Manjaro for the first time, it asked me whether I wanted ISO or ANSI. So I went through that process of telling it what keyboard layout I had, and it worked just fine for me. But in uh, BP9's case, that wasn't the case, and he was very quickly able to go in and just change the keyboard settings within the menu system. Found his way there. Says uh, it wasn't a big deal. It was a simple fix that I didn't even need the wiki for since I knew how to change the layout already. And BP9 also, incidentally, from our community, mentioning that the wiki has proven itself to be a fantastic resource. And you'll find that at pine64.org. And it really is. It's a community-driven site. And so as problems come up, folks are posting there on the wiki in kind of like a documentation format to be able to help other folks who are encountering those same issues. Ryan Howard is on our YouTube channel and says he's unable to get the OS uh, for the Pinebook Pro burnt onto an SD card. He asks, please, how do you do this? A video would be great. Well, here you are. This is video, so I, I will do this thing. All right, so the first thing that we need to determine is whether we want to use an SD card or the built-in EMMC. Um, and there are a couple of things that would be kind of a deciding factor. SD cards are a really, really easy way to be able to switch back and forth between multiple distros. You got to kind of pop, you push in if you have one in there and then it pops out. So that's my SD card right there. I think I just ejected my OS while it's on. Uh oh, <laughs> don't do that. That's like pulling your hard drive. But the built-in EMMC can be a little bit more challenging to uh, to set up. But think about this. One of the things, and I'll, I'll touch on that, I'll explain that, but one of the things I like about SD cards and the ability to boot from an SD card, yeah, sure enough, I just crashed my system. Uh, I'm going to reboot. Um, the nice thing about uh, being able to boot from an SD card is let's say you've got a household um, where everybody shares the same devices. So you could give each family member, for example, or maybe you're an education facility and you want to give each student or each teacher their own SD card. So you set up the operating system on that SD card and everyone who goes to use it with the power off boots from their SD card and all their applications, everything else uh, is set up on a per user basis and nobody affects any other user because the SD card is in fact their booting hard drive. Now I just proved that doing what I just did while stupid did not destroy my Pinebook Pro operating system on my SD card. So that's a good thing. So that's kind of cool because with your own SD card, you can just boot it up and have your own settings. So I like that. Um, if you've settled on the distro that you'd prefer, it may be time uh, to install it on an EMMC. But it can be more involved, as I mentioned, because it requires sometimes opening the Pinebook Pro and you've got to use a special adapter to flash it. Um, but the process itself is the same even in that case. So if you have the adapter, you're going to burn to an EMMC. I use the term burn. Um, 
using an adapter plugged into the USB port or something like that. Uh, and it's going to be the same process. You're going to use the same software. You may have to use a different image depending on which distro you're looking at. But speaking of, there are some distros such as Manjaro that actually offer an installer. So if you burn it to an SD card, then you boot the Pinebook Pro, you can then install it to the EMMC. So you don't have to open up the Pinebook Pro. You don't have to buy an adapter to be able to flash an EMMC card. Um, so that's pretty brilliant. You've got to look through the, the wiki or the website of the individual distro that you're looking at. So we're going to head on over to pine64.org and choose the distro that, uh, that we're going to download. Um, so you just go pine64.org, click on the wiki, and go to Pinebook Pro Software. Now I'm going to go with Manjaro because we know that it's tried and true, it's the one that's coming on it. Um, and I've actually downloaded Debian on my SD card, so I'm booting from an SD card um, normally. So this is Debian running off of the SD card. We're going to change that in a couple of moments. So uh, next step is we need to get a tool to do the burning. We're going to use a tool called Balena, Bal Balena, Bal Balena. How do you say it? I don't know. And I'll explain why. Balena Etcher. It used to be called just Etcher. And as a TV show host, those were the days that I miss. Balena, B-A-L-E-N-A. -E and the reason it throws me off is because I am an old school Trekkie. And so I always want to say Balana, thinking of Balana Torres. So think about Balana and then think, oh, it's the opposite of that. Balena.io slash etcher. Now, while I'm going to be doing this on my Windows machine, you can also do this on Linux or Mac as well. So Balana, ba Balena. <laughs> <laughs> balena.io slash etcher. Download it for your platform, okay? First thing I want to do on my machine is make sure that no removable media is connected to the computer. Be sure, okay? This is step one. Back up. Pull all of your USB drives. This means unplugging the USB storage, anything that is plugged into the computer, SD cards, whatever, if you've got an SD card reader or something like that reason I do that is because we want to prevent accidentally wiping the wrong storage. If you've got a couple of USB drives plugged in, you may accidentally select the wrong one. And remember that this is a destructive process, so you're going to lose any data that's currently on the drive. So in, can I call it Etcher? In Etcher, select the image file that you downloaded. In our case, it's Manjaro. Uh, plug your card into a card reader, uh, or again, if you're using EMMC, use the adapter. Uh, and you do need to buy that adapter separately. Etcher should detect and pre-fill in the select drive section the moment that you plug in your drive. Click flash to begin. And on Windows, it's going to ask me to click to allow the administrator access. Uh, Linux or Mac are instead going to request my root password to proceed. As I mentioned, this is a destructive process. It's going to wipe whatever's on that card. So make sure that you want to proceed, okay? and then do so. All right, once the image has been written to the card, Etcher will verify that the write was successful. This may take a few minutes, so hang tight. And once that's done, if it said you were successful, you can remove that card, insert it into your Pinebook Pro. And uh, again, I'm using the SD card, so you simply plug that into the slot on the side. If you're using the EMMC, you're gonna need to install that internally. Power on your Pinebook Pro and it should automatically boot from the SD card. If you're using EMMC, make sure that no SD card is plugged in before you power on. Otherwise, you're not going to have uh, access. It's going to boot from, try to boot from SD. So there we go. Um, I'm trying to brighten the screen. Can't quite do it. You can't quite see, but I am looking at the Manjaro login prompt. Fantastic. There we have it. We are now booted and running our new distro, in our case, from a micro SD. And if you have trouble, try using a different SD card first and foremost, okay? Just in case the card has any problems. Sometimes there's compatibility issues. I haven't encountered it yet on a Pinebook Pro, but it could happen. So have a second card handy. That's the first thing you want to rule out. 
Um, and uh, also, if you still have trouble, as I mentioned, get into the Pine64 community resources like their forum, check out their wiki, join their Discord server, uh, or you can even hop onto their, uh, their subreddit as well. They've got an official one. Um, for the full list of all of the places that you can get help, visit their website at pine64.org. Now it's time to head over to the newsroom. Here's Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Google has fixed some Android flaws that allow code execution with high system rights. Publishers are suing and trying to shut down the Internet Archive. Elon Musk makes getting humans to Mars his top priority. We'll tell you how he wants to do it. Google Maps has launched new features to help travelers specifically during the coronavirus pandemic. Lenovo plans to sell Ubuntu on more ThinkPads and ThinkStations this summer. And the U.S. military could lose the Space Force trademark to Netflix, the Netflix series of the same name. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Google has pushed out security patches for dozens of vulnerabilities in its Android mobile operating system, two of which could allow hackers to remotely execute malicious code with extremely high system rights. In some cases, the malware could run with highly elevated privileges, a possibility that raises the severity of the bugs. That's because the bugs located in the Android system component could enable a specially crafted transmission to execute arbitrary code within the context of a privileged process. In all, Google released patches for at least 34 security flaws, although some of the vulnerabilities were present only in devices available from manufacturer Qualcomm. Two vulnerabilities ranked as critical in Google's June security bulletin are among four system flaws located in the Android system. The other two are ranked with a severity of high. The critical vulnerabilities reside in Android versions 8 through the most recent release of 11. An advisory from the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center said, these, vulnerabil these vulnerabilities could be exploited through multiple methods such as email, web browsing, and MMS when processing media files. Depending on the privileges associated with the application, an attacker could then install programs, view, change, or delete data, or create new accounts with full user rights. Vulnerabilities with a severity rating of high affected the Android media framework, the Android framework, and the Android kernel. Other vulnerabilities were contained in components shipped in devices from Qualcomm. The two Qualcomm-specific critical flaws reside in closed-source components. The severity of other Qualcomm flaws were rated as high. Anyone with an Android-powered device should check in settings to see if fixes or updates are available. Several of the world's largest publishers have sued the Internet Archive for its emergency library of 1.3 million books, claiming the organization is engaging in willful digital piracy on an industrial scale. Last week, the Hatchet Book Group, HarperCollins Publishers, John Wiley & Sons, and Penguin Random House sued the nonprofit better known for its Wayback Machine archive of web pages for copyright infringement. Infringement, they argued, is intentional and systematic. We understand that publishers hope to shut down the .org. The Internet Archive invited the ire of publishers and authors back in March when it decided to lift restrictions on the digital copies of library books it has acquired and scanned. Anyone that registers with the site can take out any of 1.3 million books. The complaint states, although the Internet Archive claims the real figure is 1.4 million, the Internet Archive is registered as a library but has asserted an untested theory called controlled digital lending that argues libraries are not infringing on copyright when they make digital copies of books they possess. Publishers and authors have been unhappy about this approach but held fire while the Internet Archive restricted the number of ebooks it would make available at any given time to the number of physical books it possessed. That restriction went out of the window in March, however, when the Internet Archive decided that due to the coronavirus, it would make all its ebooks available without a waiting list. 
The Authors Guild said the organization has no rights whatsoever to these books, much less to give them away indiscriminately without consent of the publisher or author. And the Association of American Publishers called the move the height of hypocrisy and a cynical play to undermine copyright. The lawsuit filed in New York calls the electronic copies of the books of the Internet Archive that the Inter Internet Archive has made digital bootlegs. It goes on, the Internet Archive not only acts entirely outside any legal framework, it does so flagrantly and fraudulently, and it proceeds despite actual notice that its actions constitute infringement. In response, the Internet Archive's founder, Brewster Kale, has posted a brief blog post in which he notes that the organization is disappointed by the lawsuit and claims to be supporting publishers, authors, and readers. He says publishers suing libraries for lending books, in this case protected digitized versions, and while schools and libraries are closed, is not in anyone's interest. Having completed its first human launch, SpaceX founder and CEO Elon Musk says the company is now focusing on developing its next generation spacecraft, Starship. A couple weeks back, NASA and SpaceX successfully launched astronauts from U.S. soil for the first time in almost a decade. According to an internal email sent to staff, Musk said that the development on Starship is now the primary focus for the company, alongside the safe return of the Crew Dragon from the International Space Station. Starship was unveiled last September and is designed to carry a crew and cargo to the Moon, Mars, or anywhere else in the solar system, according to the billionaire. Musk's intention is to make the spaceflight vehicles uh, as reusable as planes. Four years ago, the billionaire outlined his vision of building a colony on Mars in our lifetimes, with the first rocket propelling humans to the red planet by 2025. For many years, the company used an image of the Martian surface being terraformed, turned Earth-like, in its promotional material. However, a NASA-sponsored uh, study published in 2018 dismissed these plans as impossible with today's technology. Last year, Musk tweeted he believed it was possible to make a self-sustaining city on Mars by 2050 if we start in five years. According to SpaceX's most recent detailed plans published in 2016, there are two phases for the first human transmissions as part of a programming to colonize Mars. The first will take place in 2022 when at least two Starship rockets will land on Mars. These will be unmanned spacecraft but containing drones and robots which will confirm whether there are sufficient resources of water on the planet and check for any geographic risks. The second phase will start in 2024 when another pair of Starship spacecraft will land on Mars with the first astronauts. These spacecraft will bring equipment and supplies as well as a number of production plants for ongoing life on the planet as well as develop a base of operations. Separately, the successful mission for NASA has given the company a boost ahead of the U.S. Space Agency's new moon landing program, which will return humans to the moon by 2024 and lay the groundwork for a manned mission to Mars. NASA's new Artemis program is named after the mythological sister of Apollo, the first moon mission's namesake, and is intended to fly the first woman to the moon. The Artemis program will be used as a way to develop something called the Lunar Gateway, essentially a version of the ISS but orbiting the Moon, allowing it to be used as a stepping stone for missions destined for Mars. NASA has given SpaceX and Blue Origin the nod to develop its new lunar landers, which will take the first woman and the next man to the surface of the Moon. Thanks, Becca. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, our crypto correspondent Robert Koenig is here to share the status of the cryptocurrency market, and Becca has more tech news. Stick around. Welcome to the Crypto Corner, and welcome to the Weekly Crypto News. And as usual, let's take a look into how the market performed over the last seven days. As you can see, we've got seven projects that gained over 15%. Uh, 
Uh, the winner is Wax with almost 60%, Loop Ring with 50%, and so on. Most of these projects are really serious and good projects with huge teams behind them, which is great news for the industry. On the losing side, there are only two projects above 15%. One is Hex, the other one is Hedge Trade, um, uh, which uh, is, yeah, uh, it just shows how the market is performing at the moment. It's on the up. Next headline is Bitcoin Core released uh, the version 0.2. There's one feature in it that it's worth mentioning, which is the ASMAP. And that is a, a software, part of the software that prevents attacks by uh, nation states. And <clears throat> this feature makes it possible to limit the number of nodes that are connected to any specific autonomous system. So previously a country, a huge country could attack the Bitcoin blockchain. This can now be prevented. So that's also good news. Next one is a small uh, project that everybody can use, create your own token. So with this software, and I'll put a link down below, um, you can create your own token. So you, you enter the token name, the token symbol, uh, the number of decimals you want to have, uh, the maximum supply, you click on create token, and voila, you have your own uh, token created. Uh, you can put that token even on an exchange and create li liquidity. Um, so if you've got a great idea, this is a perfect tool that you can use to put that uh, idea into practice. Or if you just want to have a present, a birthday present, there you have got another idea. Next one is PwC, one of the largest accounting firms. Um, they created a report, a crypto hedge fund report. And I just, uh, I will also put a link of that report in the, in the description down below. <clears throat> the highlights here are from my point of view that um, of those uh, hedge funds that they analyzed, 97% uh, hold Bitcoin. I wonder what what the other three are doing. But anyway, 97% hold Bitcoin, followed by Ethereum, XRP, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and EOS. Um, no other coins are mentioned uh, in that uh, report that are worth uh, any substantial amount. Um, those uh, hedge funds are mainly uh, operating in the US and the, the UK, the two big financial hubs in the world. And they're based in the Cayman Islands, US and British Virgin Islands, so low tax havens. Uh, the market is uh, increased by 30%, although that's still very small. It increased from 2 billion to 3 billion uh, this year. <laughs> As I said it's still uh, a small market. Next one is uh, DeFi, which is my favorite subject because that one DeFi in itself will start the next uh, bull run in our market. I'm pretty sure about that. <clears throat> if you look here, that Lending Club, which is a big peer-to-peer -peer lender here in the US, they originated $250 million loans in the first five years. Well, Maker, which is our peer-to-peer um, -peer lender, uh, originated 2.4 billion uh, loans in the last uh, uh, well, five years. If I look into DeFi market cap, which is like coin market cap, but only for the T, uh, DeFi industry, you can see that um, we are running on $2.2 billion uh, market cap at the moment. Uh, MakerDAO, of course, is the number one, but everything is green, as you can see here. Uh, so, and that also reflects on what I see out there in the market. I went to see a few um, forums, um, DeFi forum or finance forums, um, the, the, they had no idea on what is going on in our market. They don't understand this here. They don't know what the smart contract is. They don't understand DeFi. They always translate it back to what they're accustomed to with a middle person uh, creating the market, but don't understand that this can be done much, much easier and by far more efficient than what we've uh, seen in the traditional system. So this one here, <clears throat> the DeFi market is one to take care and watch. Anyway, that's it from me from this week. I hope uh, you're all well and I wish you the best and thank you very much for watching and see you next week, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder to those of you who are watching at home, we are not providing financial advice here on the show. 
we're just simply giving you the facts about the cryptocurrency market and leaving the decisions up to you. Just be mindful, cryptocurrency is an ever-changing market. It's always volatile. And we suggest that you only invest what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Traveling during the pandemic can be tough. That's why the latest version of Google Maps for Android and iOS has several features that might help travelers get around safely. Now, when you look up public transit directions, maps will show COVID-19 related alerts. Google points out that data will only be available where it can get info from the local transit agencies and only on trips that are likely to be affected by COVID-19 restrictions. These alerts are rolling out in Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Brazil, Colombia, France, India, Mexico, Netherlands, Spain, Thailand, United Kingdom, and the U.S. And Google says they're going to, they're coming to more countries soon. Maps will also display alerts when you navigate uh, to medical facilities or COVID-19 testing centers, warning you to verify eligibility and facility guidelines to avoid being turned away or causing additional strain on the local healthcare system. Alerts for medical facilities are rolling this week in Indonesia, Israel, the Philippines, South Korea, and the U.S. Alerts for testing centers will only be, be available in the U.S. Again, Google says it will only show these alerts when it can get author authoritative data from local, state, and federal governments or from their websites. Google says the app will also tell you how crowded buses, subways, and transit stations will be. Plus, you'll be able to see when a transit station has historically been less busy so you can plan ahead. Google says these features are powered by aggregated and anonymized data from users who opt in to Google location history. They'll be rolling out in the next several weeks. Finally, the app will show you driving alerts notifying you about COVID-19 checkpoints and restrictions along your route, for example, when crossing national borders. This feature will initially only be available in Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. Lenovo has announced that they're including Ubuntu as a preloaded OS option or a number on a number of their systems starting this summer. Lenovo is already well represented within the Linux hardware community, having certified a swath of its devices for various different distros over the years. And the company recently revealed plans to sell laptops preloaded with Fedora and make more firmware updates available through the vendor neutral Linux vendor firmware service. But now it's going even further with the Linux Love. Lenovo says all of its ThinkStation and ThinkPad P-Series laptops will be available to buy with Ubuntu LTS preloaded and not just a few specific configurations stashed away on a hard-to-find storage page somewhere. While the same devices can be bought with Windows 10 or Red Hat, Enterprise Linux pre-installed, it's still a major win for Ubuntu and the wider Linux community. The company also says it will upstream device drivers directly to the Linux kernel to help maintain stability and compatibility throughout the life of the workstation. Of course, it's easy enough to buy a ThinkPad running Windows and install Ubuntu manually, but the official support means buyers can be certain that all hardware works with Ubuntu out of the box. No drivers to hunt down or config files to edit. Presumably, it also means some cost savings as well, since a Windows license need not be included. Lenovo says Ubuntu LTS benefits from an extended five-year support cycle, providing increased user confidence and system stability across the deployment. Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu, performs certification and regression testing on these systems on an ongoing basis to ensure that it remains as stable as possible for end users. The United States Space Force was only announced two years ago and has yet to engage in any military operations, but the latest branch of the U.S. Armed Forces already stands to lose its first battle to Netflix's Space Force. The streaming service pre premiered its new comedy series Space Force on May 29th. The show's name has no relation to the newest organization of the U.S. military, which unveiled its official flag only two weeks earlier. Because of the common moniker, though, the United States Space Force's first battle might be a trademark war fought in court rather than in space. 
Attorneys for the U.S. military have done little to secure the Space Force name as a registered trademark. Netflix, however, has been far more aggressive and has already locked down the rights to the name in several countries. Despite sharing a name, both entities have plenty of room to maneuver without evoking much confusion. The streaming comedy is unlikely to make its viewers think they're watching a series about an actual branch of the U.S. military. The U.S. Space Force, meanwhile, has yet to get off the ground, both, both literally and figuratively. While Netflix's effort was the first to come to fruition, the U.S. Space Force was first announced by President Donald Trump in March 2018. The military branch was officially established as a formal organization last December. Netflix, meanwhile, greenlit the 10-episode series in January 2019. Created by Greg Daniel and Steve Carell, Space Force stars Carell, John Malkovich, Ben Schwartz, Diana Silvers, and Tawny Newsom. Season 1 is currently available on Netflix. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Now, if you've never joined us for a Category 5 community coffee break, you'll find out more about it at Category5.tv. Just scroll down on the home page and you'll see the community coffee break there, along with our schedule when we're going to be doing the next one. It is a weekly event that we hold on Zoom, and it's an opportunity for our community to come together. And even though we're all experiencing what we're experiencing in our world today, um, we've taken the approach to say, rather than talking about those things, the things that are bringing us down right now, let's look at it and say, look, we're all stuck in this situation. What is, what is it that I'm doing that's got me excited? What is it that I'm experimenting with technologically that is really interesting to me and helping me to occupy time, whether I'm stuck at home right now or wh whatever the case may be. So the topic came up about GitHub because we're talking about programming and Peter is there almost every time for a community coffee break and Peter was asking, well, how do you use GitHub? Well, not really the, the something that we can show or talk, you know, walk you through on the coffee break, but it came up that, hey, well, that would be a really good topic to discuss on Category 5 Technology TV. And the reason that it came up initially is because when Microsoft bought GitHub, they kept it going kind of status quo as it was. And you had to pay for certain features, but then suddenly, very recently, Microsoft said, and all those paid for features, not all of them, but a lot of those paid for features that you used to have to pay for are now free. So they're, they're taking the service and they're basically giving away their premium service absolutely free at github.com. So what's GitHub? Well, GitHub is kind of like a cloud service provider for Git. It's for developers. It helps us to be able to manage our projects so that you can go back in time basically with code. And it really is helpful to be able to see those commits and see how changes have impacted your project. It's also a great storage mechanism for your code because you're able to share it with other people if you want. Now, of course, Microsoft making it free, you can now have free um, private repositories as well. And you can set up as many teams as you want if you want to collaborate with other programmers. But essentially what it does for me is it allows me to share my code online in such a way that other people can use it open source. They can compile it or use it or run it on their own uh, computers. And then if they decide, oh, well, I'd rather it work this way or maybe here's a bug and I can fix that, they can do what's called a pull request. So basically they clone my GitHub repository, my software, code, they fix it on their computer and then they do a pull request which pushes it back 
well, they push it back to their fork and then it creates a pull request for me so that I see that, hey, Joe Blow over there fixed this bug with my software. I can click a button and it will import that fix into my software. So there's a whole lot to it. And it's really, it's very powerful. It can be confusing, especially when you get into squashing and merging and, and those kinds of things, which we're not going to get into today. But what I do want to show you is how the very most basic knowledge about how Git works is going to allow you to use GitHub in an effective manner. Think of it as that, where you're putting your code out there as open source software. It doesn't have to be. You can have it private if you want. But in my case, that's what I'm doing. I want people to collaborate with me occasionally. Maybe they'll post issues if they find a bug, and then I'm still the person who has to fix it. But at least my community is coming into my software repository and saying, this is a problem and you need to fix it. <laughs> All right, so github.com is where you go. You sign up for your free account. All you have to do is click on the link and click sign up. Now, I already have an account, so I'm going to log in as myself and sign in. So you can see here that if I go to my repositories, so if I jump home here and go to, let it load here, let it load. All right, I'm just going to go straight to Cat5TV is where I host all of my, my uh, software. So go there github.com slash cat5tv and you can see how this works. So you can see that I've got a ton of software repositories and they're all different projects, all different things that I've done or that I am continuing to do. And there's pages and pages and pages of it. So once you have your GitHub account, you can log in to what you see here, which is my repositories list. But when you first sign up, you're not going to have all of these. You need to create your first repository. So the way that I'm going to do that, now understand GitHub is not required for Git, okay? And Git is not the same as GitHub. GitHub is an online service. Think of it as cloud storage for Git, okay? Um, it is not the same thing. It is a online storage for that open source package management tool or project management tool. So here on GitHub, they've made it really, really easy to simply say new repository. So I've gone to my repositories and I've clicked on new. And then I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call this one my underscore test and a, a, an optional description. This is a test for the show. Whether you want it to be public or private. And then initialize it with a readme. It's always best to do that. It's, it makes it so that people can access it right away, including yourself. Do you want to add a license? Do you want to add a git ignore? I'm going to leave both of those empty. You'll discover what that means in the future. And create your repository. So now I have one called my underscore test, but there's nothing there. And I'm done with the browser. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my terminal. And in my terminal, I'm going to type git. Okay, so you can see that I've already installed it. If you do not have Git installed, so I'm on Linux, I'm on Debian Linux here, uh, you can type apt install git. That's what you're going to type. Uh, I'm not root, sudo su. Logged in as rock. Okay, apt install git. It's going to tell me that I already have the current, oh, there's an, no, no, I've already got it. There are other updates for me though, but Git is already the newest version. So if you do not have it, you need to install it. If you're on an RPM based system, it will be yum install Git. Um, and you can also find it in your GUI repository manager, um, your um, package manager, or whatever you use, like Syn Synaptic Package Manager, for example. Um, so once you have Git installed, make a folder probably in your home folder, and we'll call this um, repositories just so that I, I have a place where I always know that my code is, right? So this is going to be a local copy of my Git repository. So now I'm going to type git clone, and we're going to copy this URL, github.com slash cat5tv slash my underscore test. So I can copy that just with control C. Uh, you're going to get used to just typing it. 
it's your username slash your repository. And now, so if I look at my file system, so it's cloned, git clone, and then the name of the, or the URL of the repository. So now if I go to my home folder, and then into repositories, notice it's owned by root because I su super user dude to sue. So now there's a folder called my test, and within my test there's a file called readme.md. So within this um, folder, so I'm going to go into my test, and I want to create a new file. I'm going to call this uh, nano test.sh, and we'll create a quick um, sh file to run a bash script, and I'm going to type uh, echo, hi there, how's that? Oh, I should really stick with the, the norm, hello world, how's that? Okay, so I've written that out, and I've closed it, so now you see there's a file called test.sh. Now, when I transfer a file up to GitHub, the um, the permissions are going to be included with that push. So if I do dot slash test dot sh, you notice it says permission denied. I need to make it executable. Uh, executable. Ch mod plus x test dot sh. So now if I type test dot sh, it says hello world. So I now have my very first bit of script ready to go up to GitHub. It's part of my repository on my local computer, but it's not yet in GitHub. So if you look at GitHub, I'm going to refresh just to prove it. You see your file list here, and there's still just the readme. Okay. So now back in my terminal window, I'm going to again use that git command. I'm going to go git add star within the repositories folder. That's saying find any files that have any changes and add them. Okay. Git commit dash am and then in quotes give your commit a name. So I'm going to say my first script. And these are just short little descriptions, and hit enter. And now it's saying, hey, you need to tell us who you are, because you've never ever run git on this computer before. So you need to run these two uh, commands, pretty straightforward. git config dash dash global, you only have to do this once, don't worry, user.email, and if you have trouble typing that, just copy it, okay? Um, and then in quotes, I'm going to put Robbie at category5.tv. And that's just telling it my email address. Then I'm going to go user.name. Oh. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's actually a really bad storm outside of our studio today. So the lights are flickering a few times. and But uh, I think we're going to get through it anyways. So, all right. Delete that and change my name to Robbie Ferguson. Enter. Okay, done. So I only have to do that once. So now, see, next time I run that git commit dash am, it's just adding it, okay? So I've added it, and it sees that one file has changed. There are two insertions, and test.sh is new. So it's going to create that. So now the final command that I need to enter is git push origin, and I'm going to specify the master, which is the branch master. So origin master. And now it's going to ask me for my username and password, which I entered when I created my account. So cat5tv is my username. And my password, I use LastPass and generate new passwords all the time. And they are massive and crazy. So I copy the password and then I paste it. And there it goes. It's uploading that data to my repository and it's done so F5 to refresh and you should see that test.sh is now part of my github repository for my underscore test and there it is and it shows it that it's executable hello world so now back here so let's just pretend I've made changes elsewhere so on another computer and I'm going to do this through the browser just to show you so on this system I'm going to go um, echo hello again, okay? And then I'm going to save those changes. I'm not going to give it a, uh, a name or anything like that. Description, I'm just going to confirm. So now the script looks like that. So see how I changed that in the browser as well? You can do this from anywhere. So now if I look at my file locally on my computer in the repository, there we go. It still just says hello world, okay? So I'm going to go get pull. Again, I'm doing this all within the my underscore test folder. So git pull. 
is going to then look for any changes that have been made elsewhere and pull them down to my computer. So it's always synchronizing those changes. So now if I open Nano and open that file, you can see that new hello again is now part of that. So I'm going to show you um, echo hello times three. And I'm going to save that. And now I'm going to do the exact same thing, but I'm going to show you how it's different now that I've already entered my name and my email address. Git add star. Git commit dash am final update. Git push origin master. Cat5tv is my username. And my password is a string of about 64 characters, randomly selected. And I'm going to paste that in, and there we go. So that's all there is to now pushing my changes locally to the GitHub server. So that shares it again with everyone else or with my other systems when I do a git pull. So by doing that, I can git clone, pardon me, git clone something. And it doesn't have to be mine. It can be someone else's GitHub repository as long as it's public. But then I can make changes to it on my local machine, and then I can do a push. Now, you have to own the repository in order to do a push. So the way to make changes to someone else's repository is to fork it. So when you go to the repository, you click on the button called fork, and it basically makes a copy of it in your own account that you can make changes to. And then that's where you can do pull requests. But those are the basics to get you started. That's going to allow you to create repositories, upload your files, upload your code, be able to manipulate it from any system so you can test it on a Raspberry Pi, on your Windows machine, on your Linux desktop, on whatever, and then push all those changes up to the server so that they can be downloaded or pulled to all of your systems. So that's all there is to it. We are on Twitter at Category5TV. I'm personally on Twitter at Robbie Ferguson. Thank you so much for joining me again this week, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Go to our website, Category5.tv, for all the latest, and I'll see you soon. Bye.